start recording. I'm not looking for any great insights here. All I'm looking is for you to just kind of say what your thinking is. That's all we're looking for here. Well, that didn't work. What do we got? Oh, that big old Earl. Yeah, sorry about that. That's all right, Jennifer. Um, you can go in and just, you know, click on it and highlight it out, or I might just do it you can delete your note. Your sure, notes, you can do anything you want to. It doesn't offer a copy link on my computer. Well, good question. So you're looking at an image, right? And when you right click on it, you don't get a copy image URL because it's copyright. In other words, they, on that site where it came from, they've got everything locked down. Okay. This is why I like using this. One, when I do this with kids, it's a great way to say to kids, okay, there's where the door is shut. You don't go past that door. Of course, then kids try to figure out when to go past that door. And it'll always let you do this save image as. Jen, you can always do that. But again, you know, should we? So, all the ones that I'm doing, there is no copy link. Yeah, I don't get it either. I just get copy shortcut. So you're not seeing the ability to copy the link either? Mm -hmm. When I click through, I... Okay, so you landed on a page where you want the picture to be. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's go back to where you found that image that you then want to use. Can you get me? I'll try that. Okay. Did you do a Google search to find that picture? I did. Well, let's keep going back to the yeah. Google. I see where you're at. Keep going back. Go so back? Mm -hmm. Well, I was... Oh, you're flipping through? Yeah. Okay, here we are. All right, that's right. That's just for giggles. Let's just grab a picture here and go right click on it and see if you have that ability. Yeah, you have it? Mm -hmm. Yep. Interesting. What are we in? Uh, are you fire? Or... Don't use it. Don't use Internet Explorer. There's the easiest answer. Oh. I don't know why Microsoft keeps up to pretend that they have a browser. <laughs> they should just walk away from that business altogether. They own enough. You know, they don't need to own the browser. We've had some very um, vocal discussions up here about putting next on in the lab down the hall here that has 10, Windows 10. I'm a Chrome person. I'm a big Chrome guy. All right, I'm not going to spend too much time on that. You can get it. This is not a gradable thing. I just wanted to show you something that could be used. Um, if I had a smart board in my classroom, I could put the Padlet up here on the smart board screen and have kids literally walk up and do a double tap, or actually just tap, and then the, the little box appears for them to put stuff in. And of course, since it's a smart board, they can take the pen out of the train and could write in the box, or they can use the keyboard. Okay. Now, you want to build a Google Classroom real fast? Let me start. Mary, do you have a Google Classroom? I do have her still. Can you hear me? How do we get into the Google Classroom? First of all, you'll need a Gmail. You already have a Gmail account. You have you 
will not use that Gmail when you become a teacher. They will give you a separate one that will reflect who you are inside the world of whatever school district you work in. So remember, what we're creating for this class could call you into your classroom, but it won't be a natural thing. To moving things around inside of Google. And once you create a Gmail account, you're automatically given a Google account. I mean, it automatically gives you all this stuff. Okay? And of course, the reason why school districts all over the country have run to this, and actually universal, well, the entire Big Ten runs on Google, is because it's free. A Google domain for an entire school district for universal. So, to get to it, I'm going to go classroom.google. That's the other thing I love about it. Everything is real simple. .com. Now, when I do that, the Google automatically goes, hey, there's Steve. Steve's back. And it lets me see everything I've paid. Let's first get you in. So, classroom.google.com. Log in with you. Have an email account. Make it right now. Very easy. Write it down. As I said, when you're hired, they will give you an email address and they will give you a Gmail login. They give you what they do is they turn off the Gmail capability. In other words, if you're in school, you can't sit down and open up Gmail.com and see stuff out. But they still have the opening in the server so that that Gmail account username and password could allow you. Okay? So the first thing we do once we land here is up there in the upper right there's a little plus sign. And I'm going to click on that plus sign. And I'm going to create a class. Using classroom at a school with students. If so your school must sign up for at least a free da 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 da. And you're not in a classroom at a school, so you can make sure you put that check in there. By the way, this is not the case anymore. This I'm going to basically say I'm not, and I'm now going to continue, and now it wants me to create the class. I would call this class your last name, give it your last name in the name of our Mary U B E A. Don't need to worry about section and subject and all that. Now, when you get a real class, this will all be done. Believe it or not. See, if you've never, uh, you've never been in classroom before, they've changed. It, okay, to, to much the better. 
And so one of the things that we can do is right away, you'll notice like my classroom, I named it Steve. Whatever you named it now shows up there, right? You see that? Okay. Over here where it says about, select theme or upload photo. You'll be able to change this back here by using that. And so all you have to do is go over here to select theme. And there's the Googs choices. Now, if you want to put something a lot more personable to you, in other words, either a picture of you with your dog or your class or, you know, something like that. You can go and use the upload photo and you can put in here, um, you know, whatever you want to put in here. Let's see if I've got something. The joke is over the years, for some reason, whenever I've shown stuff, I've always picked this koala picture that's in the, uh, you know, the, the default pictures thing. And... So now I just do it. So I'm going to get my little friend here and I'm going to put him in, maybe just to his eyes and the top of his nose. Okay. And there you go. That's simple. Very important. I clicked on the little link over here that says about. And you'll see that Steve's class has a class code Q97OU0U. Okay? You need to remember that. Well, you don't need to remember because it it'll always be sitting there. So when you get ready to build something, like when we get back from um, our little vacation, you're going to be able to create something somewhere else, and you're going to put it in here. And then... To let me know, let me see it, get into it. When you go to put your assignments into the live text, you would just drop this little code in there. And you say, hey, Stevie, I'm at Q97OU0U. You'll tell me yours, and that way I can get to yours, and I'll join your class. As you notice, when I went up there and clicked on the plus sign, it said, join a class, create a class. And that's how I will be able to see what you've done. I'm going to look around just a bit more so you can see things. So right now what we've done is we have this sort of nice look. You can change anytime you want. In fact, I know teachers who kind of like you change your bulletin boards. They go in and they change your Google Classroom things, depending upon the season of the year, maybe what they're studying at the time. Um, you can actually put in here, uh, I think I'm right about this. It was this way on the old one. You can actually put animated GIFs in here. Now, you don't want to get too crazy. You know, you'll have that poor kid. They'll be sitting there just staring at that and not hearing a word you say. Because they'll be sitting there going, why is that moving? You know, trust me. So you can do all kinds of things here. Let me walk you through the people we don't care about. We don't have any peoples. <laughs> okay? So that's fine. I'm not going to be a student or anything like that. You're just going to give me the code, and that way I can just drop in and look at it. But when you get a class, into the campus will already have dropped everybody in here. So you'll go into that, and you'll see every kid that's in your class. And I'm only going to teach first grade. I don't care. it will be sitting there. Well, I'm going to teach kindergarten. Don't care. It'll be sitting here. Now, whether or not you'll have to use it is another thing. Right now, the district, and when I say the district, I do mean everybody right now. Um, Jeff, Bullet, Odom, where else do I know? Henry. They're pretty much not saying you must, you must, you must. Okay. Now, schools, on the other hand, uh, if the principal and the principal's council or the SBDM, if they have agreed that they're going to go with this thing, there you are. You're going to use it. So for our purposes, we don't really care that much about people. Classwork, we do. Um, when we create some things, this is where we're going to 
put stuff in so that we can demonstrate to Steve our understanding of what we're playing with. Uh, we'll do that when we get over to module three. The stream, whenever I hit this one, I always hear that Kenny Rogers song. Remember Islands in the Stream? I don't know why it plays in my head. This is where you can put uh, announcements. Uh, you can respond to kids' posts. Now, this is where, in other words, when you put in a work assignment and kids start responding back to it, you see it here. Okay. Again, no need to worry about it. What we're going to be working with mainly is located over here where this plus sign is. And you can see right above it, it says create an announcement. Now, this is the part that drives me nuts about the gook. Why don't they call it a post? No. I don't know why they don't do this, but there it is. So as you can see, when you have created something, it's going to go in here. Um, when we do our pictograph, and we're going to do our infographic, but we're going to do probably the week after we get back from the virtual <coughs> break. Uh, you can put the link in here, and then that link will show up as a little thumbnail. You use your friend right there. It'll show up as a thumbnail in your announcement. In other words, you'll say, here is my pictograph <coughs> or infographic about chapters two and three. Put the link there, poof, shows up. What they don't do, like I said, that drives me nutsy, is they don't allow you to do what's called embeddable, uh, which is the code that allows the thing that you have created to be live here. Now, the Google has said they don't do that because the Google, what the Google's trying to prove with the Google Classroom is they can also uh, supply security. Okay. Uh, they want to be able to say, well, nobody's ever going to see these lists of names. Because we have a secure site. So far, so far, it's held up. Um, you know, the first crack will be when somebody figures out how to get in there and because you can put grades in this thing, and people do, and change the grades. That'll be something stupid like in most schools, uh, you had kids that were office aides who could actually go in and see grades in high schools. And because they took advantage of that. But this is very, very simple to do. We can we can attach something. So if you want to put a picture in here, you could do that or a file. We can go to our Google Drives. You now have a Google Drive. Uh, and if you have something that you've saved to your Google Drive, you can then drop it in here. You know what that is. That's good old YouTube. And then you have your little linky linky. And that, my dear friends, is all we need to do with our Google Classroom. So let's review. We created a class, <coughs> we gave it a name, and we put our last name and then our class in there. We did, if you wanted to, change the look of your banner at the top. And right now you don't have anything to put in it. So you're cool. Everything is good. The other thing that they have done that I love, 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 because, boy, this one drove me nuts. Um, when you do things like topics, well, what's a topic mean? Well, the topic is nothing more than a name for an assignment or for a series of assignments, in other words, units. And what the Goob did is you would make these topics, and they could not be moved around. I don't know about you, but like when this class, when I first got the numbers on this class in the summer, I immediately jump over to Blackboard and I start putting things together. If you were to go ahead and do this in the old version, topic number one was topic number one, and you couldn't mess with it. In other words, if you sat down, you went, you really ought to be, we ought to be doing that maybe beginning of October, not the first thing. You can't mess with them. Now, you can mess with them. You can move them up and down, and you can change the titles. Smart, smart, smart. 
for those of us who like to plan and develop ahead. All right, I'm going to back out of that. Don't lose that. Very nice people. Very nice. I switched over to Chrome. I can't edit my posts now. Yeah, you know, Microsoft was the first browser that was so full of holes that people were taking advantage of it to pass you know, nefarious things into the computer. That they went to the extreme. And now everything is so locked down, you can't breathe inside the thing. Chrome basically said, we'll take care of it on our end. You don't have to worry about it on your end. So basically, I, I can only mess with it if I go back to the other one. Because I can't add anything to the post now. I can't edit it. You can't? I can't. Um, as you can see, this is the horrible... <laughs> Uh, scanned in original document that he that I used uh, because he gave me permission but later on he felt sorry for me and he gave me the actual PDFs right here okay so there they are so what I'm going to do is I'm going to start here now I did this a little bit last week when we were together but I really want you to understand who this man is. Okay. Um, and I don't say this because I actually know him. As I told you, Prince Albert uh, Hub across the street from the College of Education, University of Toronto. Shared a few pictures of cream over with him. I'm telling you this because he is one of the fundamental thinkers in education theory today. Now, a lot of people don't know his name, but as soon as you say change knowledge or deep learning, it's that guy, okay. one of the guys. Um, he has been around for a very long time, although, well, yeah, he's probably 10 years older than me. His thinking is extremely... Some people would say radical. I would say fundamental. In other words, the change knowledge that he wants to do, he wants to do starting with you. He care less about structures in a school district. In other words, he could care less about a superintendent who wants to do cool things. Makes it easier. But what he really cares about is individual schools. Um, there is a school in Toronto in a part of Toronto that has the greatest density of population of anywhere in the world. And that really blew me away when I went into that school. Because you know, I'm standing there going, wait a minute, wait a minute. There are places in Hong Kong and Singapore and uh, Delhi, India that have just people sitting on top of each other. And they said, nope, we have it. And then if you go outside the building, it's in downtown Toronto. It's very much an urban setting. It's nine stories tall. It's an elementary school, nine stories tall. And it is literally surrounded by the Stalinesque apartment blocks. You know what I mean? Like when you see pictures of where people live in Moscow and St. Petersburg, they all live in these giant, big, you know, concrete buildings. That's where these kids come from. They are primarily, primarily South Asian. Um, there are very few whites in the school. There are lots and lots of Indians, Pakistani, uh, Indonesian, uh, and a few, a few Chinese. They're all citizens, but this is where they have come to live. Um, there are very few African students there from the usual suspects, you know, like we have in Jefferson County. Uh, and so there's your, there's your difference. What color are the teachers? Maybe white. Okay. Okay. So already you can see 
there's a lot of similarity there to what we deal with, especially Jefferson County Public Schools. This guy at one time was the Minister for Education for the province of Ontario. The way that Canada works is its states are called provinces, and it's a confederation. In other words, the people in who have would have loved for this country to remain sort of these nebulous little states would have loved, would, would love Canada because it's a confederation, meaning the real power lives in the provinces. Ottawa, the federal government, doesn't really have as much power as our federal government has. Power resides in the local provinces. Um, the provincial capital for Ottawa is Toronto. The federal capital for the whole shooting match of Canada is in Ottawa, which is up here. You think of Ontario as a big, long rectangle. Um, Toronto's right here across the lake from Chicago, uh, Detroit. It's very easy to get to. It's about a 10 hour drive. You go across the, is it called the Freedom Bridge? No, it's not the Freedom Bridge. It's some kind of name like that. You go across the bridge and about halfway across, you know, the Mounties are there. And then when you come back, you know, the Americans are there. So here it is. Here's all the way up. And then above that are the polar bears. How big it is. It's a big place. Everything in Canada is big. Uh, and the polar bears also have some native people. The first people. So Mike was the provincial minister of education. You know, it's kind of like our commissioner for education in the state of Kentucky. Hell of a lot more power. Hell of a lot more power. Although, you know, Lewis has an awful lot of power, as we've noticed, as he's marched in here into Jefferson County and said, you're going to have to pay. But he really did have some power. So what he tried to do in places like this place was called the Rose Street Elementary. Nine stories tall, packed to the gills with people. Uh, kids from all over the world. What they were trying to get at was they were trying to understand how do we reach kids, help them understand their learning. Not to we unscrew their head, pour a bunch of junk into it, not junk, pour a bunch of facts into it, and then have them regurgitate it back. But how do we get them to actually think about, synthesize their learning? There is nothing cooler than being in a classroom, I don't care where, I've seen this ever, and having kids use a big word, kids using their epistemic agents. Hey, how does a carburetor work on a car? So maybe right there, take a guess. Okay, fair enough. So what Katie just did is she showed her epistemic Now let's suppose that Katie did have a little carburetor in the car. Let's pick something. Something to actually do. So tell me how you would uh, teach kids what practice. So right away you now I've tapped into something that Katie knows. Remember what I told you the first night we were in here. And one of us is any smarter than all of us. Epistemic agency is where kids will sit there and say to you, get this, I don't get that. Now, you can say, well, if they find that out stupid, if I give them a test. Wait, wait, wait. You can get kids to the point where they can actually interface with our curriculum through something maybe like Google Classroom and say what I heard this hack talk about was this. Get this. Get this. Get this. Get this. Get this. 
I've seen it fifth grade, Greenwood Elementary. You were Greenwood Elementary? Art up against Pleasure Ridge Park High School. I've seen it done in um, Englehart Elementary. I've seen it done in Rutherford Elementary. Am I talking to West East End High School? No. Okay, teachers firmly believe in the idea that kids, we can teach them how to enunciate what it is they know but more important than don't or don't understand. Well, I've got these four folks in my class. Jennifer down there said, well, look, you do it this way. Katie says, do it this way. Right. When I get somebody who does it, they can say that. Who am I going to work with? Then when we get to it, we're going to understand something called universal design for learning. And it says the following. If we design for everybody, the people who need that design benefit. People out here on the other side, so if we design for people who need the structure, need the help, need the extra, and everybody benefits from it. Let me walk you through this real fast. You agree with that statement? Let's pull this apart a little bit. You all are not that much older that you probably had an experience with phones and high schools and out there state. What was your high school's position on phones in school? No phone. We don't want to see it. We see it. I'm taking it away from you. Like if she had that phone out in the class, the teacher could walk over and pick it up for her. There. Unless it right. was writing and then we could listen to yeah. music. What were you going to say, Kate? I was just going to say we had one year where they tried letting us have them and it was bad. Where was this? PRP. Yeah. And so we hear this all the time. You know, I mean, we, we had this wonderful. Uh, I call it the technological spring in Jefferson County Public Schools, where we try to say, you know, they've got all these things, let's let them use it. And then the sexting episode happened out at Eastern High School, where kids are sending pictures of themselves in various stages of undress. Okay? And then everybody at the board just ran for the hills. <laughs> They're sending nerdy pictures of themselves. <laughs> Here's a news flash. It's been going on as long as I've been around. Now, in my day, and that would be a good 50 years ago, ancient history, we had these little cameras called Polaroids. <laughs> you know? Yep. And the, the, I love this name. The camera that every kid owned, because they were cheap, was something called a swinger. <laughs> Does it take a big leap of the imagination? <laughs> so, I've got the hots for Kate. And I'm in her class with her. I just walk over and drop an envelope on her desk. What's inside the envelope? A swinger picture. <laughs> What's the difference? What's the diff? Right? It's still inappropriate use of technology. You know, we talk about texting each other. We call that passing notes. Right? And there was these very formalistic rituals of how to pass a note in a class. Because it was kind of like, okay, if I do this this way, Mrs. Smith or Mrs. Jones or Mr. whoever, they won't care. But if I do it, you know, obviously, I, you know, if I do it that way, football players always had somebody in the class they could bend upon, and they would give the note to that little schmo, and then he or she then was supposed to pass it on to the person. 
There's nothing new here, guys. There's nothing new. The newness is we suddenly have moved from this very small space of me passing notes, little swinger camera photos to the whole friggin' world. Let me give you a news bulletin. 25 years ago, I was on a team working in Jefferson County Public Schools. We had this goofy idea. What if we let kids bring their computers to school? Just about the time when laptops had really kind of taken hold. They were still pretty expensive, but they were coming down in cost. You know, they're still around, well, they still are around the $1,000 mark. But we were thinking about, could we allow kids to walk in with their own equipment? And of course, the problem was, as soon as you walked in and you got onto our network, and if your machine was full of crap, viruses, trojans, anything like that, it would then pass into the network of, at large of the school and then on out into the network at large of the district. So we started a really serious study of how to, it was called hardening off servers. How do you prevent junk from being passed along from individual computers? About that time was our first encounter with something called, uh, oh, which worm was it? Salmon worm? Salmon worm? Anyway, it was our first serious uh, virus that took the district down for a month. In other words, nothing worked. No internet, no mail, nothing. And we literally had to go touch every single computer, thousands upon thousands of computers in the district to get rid of this thing. So we were very interested in trying to figure this out. And we did. And we would literally... I had a computer that I took with me to Toronto at one time, um, something I was doing there with the school bed there. And when I got home with it, it was just loaded with crap. Trojans, virus, you name it, it was sitting there. And before I killed it all out with Norton's antivirus, I brought it in to the committee. And I said, here we go. Here's a machine that's full of crap. I have already documented what crap is sitting in this machine. Let's go ahead and pick a school. It was Eastern High School we were going to do it at. Why Eastern? They had the most computers of any school in the district at the time. So he took my little laptop. It was a little uh, Macintosh one. Had the little ball. Didn't have a trackpad. It had a little ball that you rolled around to move the mouse. We took that out there and we plugged it into the network. And we could see all this crap coming off this machine got to the server there, and that's where it stopped. So we have already solved that issue. It's not an issue anymore. Now we're down to the issue of how people interface. Not the machines anymore. It's time the gadget goes to school, and school goes to gadget 24-7. It is tech teachers with technology who will make the difference. Students are partners. Boy, this is an old monster. It's been around forever. The kids who have the iPads at Homestead North have already worked very hard to try to figure out how to get around the proxy filter, the thing that says you shall not go there. Mm -hmm. They have already have worked very hard to figure out how to go into, and if you have an iPhone or an iPad, you know what I'm talking about, how to go in and get their own account into the Apple Store, um, iTunes, etc., how to get their own uh, username and password on the device that would be linked to their Apple account, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. They can't yet. Um, all the iPads that have been given out in Jefferson County Public Schools are being monitored by Verizon, believe it or not. They're the ones who are putting this bill. I can just see our CIO going to Verizon and saying, okay, we did that with about 5,000 people. Let's try it with 100 see how far it gets with that. So they're putting that bill. Why? Because they control it. They can control it. So when they go in and they say, thou shall not, you shall not. Unless somehow you can, well, 
if you jailbreak the device, that's the term, the technical term. In other words, you jailbreak it, it doesn't work anymore. I've done a nice job. First Android device I had, I jailbroke and had a lot of fun with. But here's what our book is going to be talking about. Old system reform, change and all. How do we get folks to start thinking differently about what we do? Learning how to learn. Lord, how many years have we talked about this? Learning how to learn. We've got to move away from this stuff in, stuff out. We've got to move away from not that it's not important. Okay. No reason. We're not throwing out the basic fundamental building blocks of knowledge. We can't. But what we keep running into over and over and over again, and the research shows this so very clearly, kids who come in with misconceptions, he writes about this, by the way, kids who come in with misconceptions because they're their misconceptions, think about yourself, they hang on to those much more strongly, much more longer than any other information they may have. Why? Well, I figured it out. Now, boy, you figured it out was wrong. Well, okay, I figured it out. You see this all the time. You do this. You may have a way of doing something and a friend comes over and says, you know, all you really need to do is, and you sit there and go, yeah, but it's my way. It's the way I do it. And teaching, that's a, that's a really important fundamental thing that we have to acknowledge. That people walk in with misconceptions, and it's our job to help them understand why it's a misconception, and to help them understand how to change that. This gets into the area of pedagogy. You know what pedagogy is, how you teach. And so if we understand how to use this Google Classroom, if we understand how to leverage this technology so that it takes over that sort of supplemental role, I have 28 people in my room. 22 of them got it, the six did not. What do I do? Move on. With technology, I have a way to reach those six again and again and again. Okay. Danielson's, excuse me, Tomlinson's differentiated instruction. I don't know, you know, from a, you heard of differentiated instruction? From, you will, <laughs> boy, you ever. From a, Sort of, you know, somebody scans up and describes it to you, you go, yeah, okay, fine. In a real world use, please. Pedagogy is where we really can leverage technology use. See, there it goes right there. And this then comes back around, and what we start seeing is kids start developing that knowledge to learn to learn. I have a wife who really wanted to become a DIYer because her husband, I started flipping houses when I was teaching, it was like my 10th year as a teacher. And I looked around and said, damn, this is all the money I'm gonna make. And there was a guy who lived across the street from us. We, were, we lived in the Highlands. And at the time, the Highlands had a lot of stock, you know, a lot of houses. They were kind of sitting there looking sad and depressed that at one time had been very pretty little cottages, Victorians, you get the idea, bungalows. This guy lived across the street from me. He was a go-getter. And so he was over at my house one day, and he's looking around, he's going, wow, you've got a lot of, you've done a lot to this little house. I said, well, actually it wasn't too hard because under the carpet were these gorgeous hardwood floors with walnut inlays, you know, all the stuff that you find in over houses. I said, and I have good friends who are plumbers, electricians, floor guys, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. He said, why don't we go and start buying up some of the older stock around here, and then we'll fix it up, and then we'll resell it. And I said, 
I'm a very poor teacher. I can't do that. He goes, I've got the cash. He said, I'll hire you as the GC, general contractor. You bring in the subs, you do the work, we flip the house, we sell the house. So my wife is always jealous. She wanted to be a DIYer too. So when she started learning how to do stuff, she wanted to learn how to tile. Do not put a paintbrush in my hand. Do not put something in my hand that has a trowel because I'm messy. Okay. I have God. I have a subcontractor. She didn't want to go there. She wanted to learn how to do it. What did I tell her to do? If you want to learn how to do it, just go YouTube it. It's sitting right there. How to do a backsplash. How to use glass tiles. How to put a tile for it. How to put a heated for it. It's all right there. Not just one. Hundreds. Hundreds. How to multiply fractions. How to you see where I'm going with this? It's all out there. In a format that as a society we have embraced. We'll cue Marshall McLuhan up when I see you again. So we, in this book, what he's going to talk about is how all of this stuff gets related. Now, the first thing he's going to talk about is the bad news. And that's your mantra for this class. How do we make the stuff that we use with kids irresistibly engaging? How do I put stuff somewhere for kids that they're actually going to look at and engage with? How do we make it elegantly efficient and easy to use? It takes you more than 15 minutes to explain how to use a piece of technology. What do you do? Unfortunately, in our district, a lot of crap that they expect you to use technological wise with kids is breaks that rule. But it's still like, you need to give it this because you're the teacher. Technologically ubiquitous. It's there 24 7, your Google Classroom. And it's steeped in real life. Uh, a couple of guys by the name of Wiggins and McTeague have a curricular framework called. Understanding by design, basically shapes everything from the top to the top. Planning, design, When he says that, speak in real life, that's an echo of those two guys. They say it this way all learning, learning, all learning, understanding, and And you figured out how to do something because you did it. The next time you went back to do it again, you had to go, well, how did that do that? But you did it. And then it sticks. We have ad hoc innovative teachers, not many innovative schools, agree. No innovative One of the things that I have found that's very tragic is the idea that we want to embrace the art. So, we created something called the curriculum. And I can, I say, the presentations that I give, I can trace exactly when this was the Back when we adopted something called the curriculum. And at the time, it was done with the best intentions. It was, you know, we have all these new teachers. So we're going to count that. And all of a sudden, we lock that in. And can't get out. There are a few of these folks. Folks will be one. Not hard to do. Oh, you want me to teach that? Fine. Go away now. I'll design the way to do it. 
but we want you to, no, go away. We tried it really hard with reading. We've got a system in the called a, a read. I called them the read police. They literally would show up at your classroom and they would say, okay, what are you doing today with the read? We were calling it. We just like, you know, We still have it in a way it's called DRA. We give kids DRAs to find out what is their base level. Okay, fine. No problem. <coughs> but then don't define that kid for the rest of whatever. Make the reading something that's engaging and something they want to do. I would call this the entrepreneurial teacher, not as a change. What does this mean? Number one, me. Does it mean to make everybody a good reader? This is where he it's back at the folks who say, you just want this loosey goosey all thing with everybody's love to you and all that. No. Make literacy an essential goal. Education. The hardest thing to get kids to do is to have them talk to each other in ways where they are passing information back and forth, trying it out, seeing where their holes of misunderstanding might be. Is something you have to teach kids. You can't just expect them to know that. When I worked in JCPS, one of the things that we would do is we would get teachers together and we would explain to them a simple idea how to teach kids civil discipline. Katie, what I heard you say just now was here's what I heard. Now you're sitting out there going, I'm here to tell you, you know, I saw kids at Inglehart Elementary. You know where Inglehart is? Birth to sick cat, old wool. Um, you know, who basically, their civil discourse was your mama's fat. Mm -hmm. Everybody knows who your mama is. That's their civil discourse. It took us about a month to working with, especially our fourth and fifth grade. But we got to start doing it. I don't understand what you just said. Tell me again. Of course, the behavior problem was right down the road. We didn't have it. Integrating higher order thinking. Very easy to do. Very easy. Challenge people without hitting their frustration level. People take when they're frustrated. Body language, my voice. There are BD kids on the book line of But we all have ways of expressing higher order thinking. It is not, not an IQ related thing. One of the things I always love taking my special needs kids into my elementary school classes, I was. I would go in and I would thank you. I would go in and I would bring my little babies in with me. And the teachers that I worked with were kind of like, are you sure it's gonna be okay? They might lick the table. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay. And then they were stunned when my little guys and gals would sit there and come up with the most insightful we talked about things like new law. I'm not down here. No, I'm up here. Let's talk about Newton's law. And then I'd reach over and grab the table cloth and pull it out from underneath a whole bunch of stuff. And the kids are all like, whoa, what do you do, man? You're a magician. No, no, I understand mm -hmm. Newton's law. 
then we would invest it. But eventually there was success. My little people would sit there and they would say, the things that still, they stay. There you go. Real life problem solving. Not fake real life problems. Last year I was at Wagner and their math classes, they were designing trebuchet. You know trebuchet? Is that thing that swings around? It's Is that thing that swings around and bloop, and throws something a mile? The Romans owed uh, Steve. So they were designing these things. Yeah, it was cool. Did it have a purpose? Unless you're going to start throwing things, it's cool. Didn't really have a purpose. I had a lady that I worked with, one of my students, a physics there. And so she did what's called the box experiment. You give a group of kids a box that's full of crap. And I don't mean bad crap, I just mean lots of things. And then you give them a challenge. Develop a machine that will climb to the top of this mountain. And she had this large paper shaped mountain that had been built about this big by this big by about this tall. And it had a, called a roadway, I guess, that went around. It also had lots and lots of sort of outcropping all over the tree. So if your thinking was, well, we'll just grab up the room. No. You could design for that. If you went out of that box and you designed so it went right up the side, you designed it. And the stuff that was in the box, there was enough stuff in the box, rubber bands, spring, wheels, uh, popsicle sticks, right? Enough stuff in the box. had to think out of that box. Now they knew it's about things like rubber band motors. You know, rubber band motors. Up the rubber band. They knew about stuff. How do you get the power out of the rubber band motor to actually pick something up, you know, that kind of uh, impulse? It's good stuff. It's really good stuff. A lot of trial, a lot of error, a lot of engineering. And all through this, that's going on. It was so funny because they at first they would have their laptops out and they had Chromebooks. They had their laptops out and they'd try to sneak them on to YouTube, right? How do you make a rubber band? You know, and I'd walk by and I'd go, Great, you tell everybody else in the room where that is. What do the guys at Ford do, do you think? They go look up what GM's doing. Well documented that this is a phenomenon. This is what we should be doing. This is what we're doing. Doing a lot of this. We're doing this. What you have the opportunity in this class to do is to sit back, kick back, and think. I can really see. I can use this. I can use this. It's a 15 minute rule. Your understanding of what you teach. Would it work? Would it support it? Would it be any good?
MPAs, LPAs, RPAs, SPAs, and SPAs. Where were all that came from? You know what I'm saying when I say LPA in here? Math performance assessment. Where were all came from? There was a young lady, a good friend of mine, who was a teacher, math teacher, in a high school, Airedale High School. And she was trying to come up with a system that would predict how kids would perform. She was one of my students in a class called um, Teaching Learning Online. It doesn't look anything like it did. Back then, we were playing around with something called FileMaker Pro. And we were trying to show people how you could build an online database. So she took this idea, and then she sat down and disaggregated the data from the test in her high school. And she realized, here's where kids were falling apart. They missed this, this, that. They didn't have this. And so what she developed was a predictive test. The kids would take all online. And then when it got when they got done with it, it would sit back. You could do X number of questions correct to demonstrate the efficiency of being able to do this part. And she applied good reliability and validity. Now you can say what happened after they took the test. Yeah, what happened? People came along and said, oh, you really don't understand that. Well, here, let me help you understand. Because now we had identified. Somebody at the board said, we got two guys over here. One was a graduate from St. X, the other graduate from St. X. Um, I'm not, not going to teach school, but we have to say it's very ironic. So they designed it. It's called Cascade. You've heard of it in school. Usually you've heard it and then you've heard it first word. But what Lisa was trying to do, very simply, was to find a way to be able to identify, don't know this, you know that. In fact, and then the school then had the ability then to say, well, you need to have help in this. Okay, over here. We can see that working with technology so, so easy that we keep walking away from it. Why do teachers walk away from technology? Are you, you know what? Anytime you go to use technology, you better have something in the back pocket. Because the one proof of technology is the tool is any of work on for whatever reason. Like the other day, the entire district was down. Everything wasn't working. Because for some reason they had to keep their bandwidth. So basically the internet says, sorry, you're taking up too much room on the internet highway. Then what do you do? You got kids sitting in, in computer labs all over the district going, I can't get to, hey, we're not going to. Still banging. In other words, they're still out there trying to get to the internet highway. And the internet highway is saying, look, we're just a little too late road. You're trying to drive a semi. I'm not going to let you do it. That's the kind of stuff that happens. You have to have that back pocket rule. If that happens, what am I going to do next? Sorry, Mike, I just accidentally clicked somewhere. No, I didn't. Teachers are needed, but is it required to be a change agent? Yes, Mike, they are. This is where we just heard. Hopefully, laboratory learning. 
here at the very beginning of vibratory burns. Uh, I see every permutation of that. The most important person in a classroom is still you. I'm going to stop right there. Because that's the message that we need to take out of here. Now let me talk about chapters 2 and 3. And I'm going to go back over uh, rule number one. Really start taking off. I need you to tonight leave me a little thing. Um, I like the way when you were doing the Padlet, you notice I stepped out. Definitely we had some really specific questions. Hey, okay, won't let me. And I walked out there and I went up to the now we work. We we'll use Chrome or Firefox on the front. Mike calls this, Dr. Cohen calls this the skinny. Okay. The skinny is we learn something that we then can pass along to the group as a whole. It's sort of a tribal thing. We all understand how to do that now. When I saw a young lady out of Greenwood Elementary doing something amazing in her class, and they were using Chromebooks and the YouTube videos. Okay. Um, what happened very quickly in that classroom was the little nerds, and what was so cool was they were just the two girls or boys. Love that. Um, they were the ones who got on the Wii video and figured out, hey, you only know, can put green screen in. Really? Now, Stephanie knew all of this, right? But because she allows for that kind of creative thinking to take place, then it's a discovery. If we can somehow get to that, and it's hard, it's very hard. The hardest part of it is the classroom now. As it is. If we can get to that, if we can get to the producer, then we'd be fine. And then just the magic place. Return. So I need you to put your little idea in there tonight. And here's that rule one. So our rule one was you're going to be creative like yourself. If you can't be for class, it's being recorded right now. Mary is going to sit out there, and if she can't be here on a Monday night because she's out there in the great beyond, which is what I call online learning. Mary's in the mm -hmm. great beyond. She has the luxury of being able to hop back in here and watch this video. You post it. Did you notice when I sent out your preview? Or actually sent out an announcement. The lab is ready for the class, okay? You're an adult. You're going to be treated like an adult. This next corollary to that is this. So, when we go into lab time, make time, work time, if you're the kind of person who is uncomfortable sitting in front of this machine, eight max, I don't do that. But I understand. Or if you're the kind of person who likes to go home, shut the door, put your headphones on, is the only way you can think. Uh, turn on a fan, is the only way you can think. I don't say that pejoratively. I say that with all respect. I want you to have your best thinking going on. Some people need to go home and let it sit. Actually, I'm kind of like that. I go home and walk my dogs at night, and we have very rich conversations walking through the neighborhood. Okay? I really mm -hmm. do. You know, the people who live in my neighborhood go, that guy is nuts. But I, I walk around and I say to my dogs, I say, okay, tonight we went over this, 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 what are they? Now, just, the dogs don't answer it. They'll go at me like that. But, you know, this the brain eventually goes, Got to tell them about that, and I'll know to cover it again. But if that's the way you operate, and I will make it very clear in class that that's the point where we have reached. Now, if you stay here and you want to stay here because you need the help or you need to ask the questions, you need to say to Steve, "Damn, you talk too fast. Slow down and explain it to me again." I will, because you know, right? I'm here. Like tonight, I leave at 7:30. So. 
down here. And you know you had the 502-457-3937 number. She used it. Did you get your thing fixed? When you used that text number? How long it take us? All right. You do it that way, it happens really, really fast. Okay? That's how Mary, who's sitting up there in Carroll County, if she has a question, she's going to text me. She already has. And she knows then she'll get an immediate response. But she is so far away from me, I have to take care of her. Because I don't have the luxury of being able to have Mary come in and physically sit in that office over there, you know, and work through whatever issues she might have. What I'm going to ask you to do when I see you again is I'm going to ask you to go ahead and read chapters two and three. Okay? Now, remember, where are the chapters? Well, they're right there. You don't have to buy the book, Mary. Ooh. They're right here. Good. They look real crunchy. <laughs> or if you go all the way into here, where it says Stratosphere Chapters PDF, right underneath where I just did that thing, that PowerPoint. And there they are. Okay? You're going to read chapter two. We will then sit around the campfire. There's a guy out there by the name of George Siemens. He has a thing called Deep People. Uh, Deep. George Siemens maintains that the way we learn best is telling stories. And he has this classic example of the way information was passed along is when the old natives sat around a campfire and said, if you want to kill a buffalo, this is how you do it. He is based out of Manitoba, and he very much has sort of a uh, first people's kind of mentality about things. But what's so cool about it is he then can proceed in modern terms and talk about how we do. So we're going to sit around the campfire, the virtual campfire, and we are going to take a look at what I call the stars of his first two chapters, and that is Marsha McLuhan, who way back in 1967 was already telling us all this stuff, and then Larry Rosen. Larry Rosen even looks like the bad guy, doesn't he? Mm -hmm. I mean, Mike kind of doesn't come right out and paint him that way, but he kind of says, no, Larry Rosen says, all oh, hell's going to break. You know, so we have Larry here. We can actually hear Larry. We can actually hear his thinking. And then all that stuff I just did, you know, about kids, higher order thinking, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That guy, his name is Mark Prince. He's claim to fame is the term digital native. And then the digital immigrant. I mean, I didn't quote I disagree with Prince, by the way. But he has a really good book out there called The Partnering Pedagogy. This is what he talked about. Good book. We used to read it. Um, and then I, when Dr. Pullen came out with his book, and there he is right there, uh, I knew that we had to go to this book. Remember this picture I told you? Go down that alleyway. No, the oh, that's not I think it should have gone. <laughs> I think it would have been, been much better video. So we're, those are sort of the stars. Uh, there's also in here some other stars. Karen, Karen Katie, I know her too. She's, she's really, really cool. Uh, Sir Ken is in there. We need, we need to hear all these voices. Once you hear these voices, then it starts to make sense when you go to make the first infographic. We'll be using the tool from a uh, website called Pick to Chart. You will learn how to do it. It won't take you long. Remember Steve's rule. Um, and then I have in here lots of examples. We will show you then how to take that infographic and then put it in there. So in a classroom, classroom. Then they do 
do what we call screen in the So, then first, let's take the chart. Let's take the graphic. Jennifer, come on here and explain your infographic to the class. I go back and sit it. I'm a part of it. She comes up, she says, I made it this way because I think this idea and this idea and this idea and this idea and this idea. Holy smoke. Get them to start thinking connections or the reason why things go together um, like the very soon. Okay. You want to be You look a little tired. You don't have a long day. Mm -hmm. When are you here? Are you physically in this building during Mondays or are you physically out there? You've been out there. Where are you? West. What school are you in? Are you where? Things are struck by fun, but one would be enormous population. Are you there, too? You agree with me? This is Wilson West is a more student than I, too many in out there, and as the system said, the ASL kids must be eating. That was the thing. And I got in trouble. And I was taken. And then I went to the map for her. From the principal to the class. Oh, not the one that's there now. Not my map. This lady actually knew from my former life. And she was that classic. This was always yours. So here's Lindsay saying, I'm letting my kids talk to each other. Man. Now, when they talk to the whole class, that's what they And she was such a shrewd observer of people. She would say, Jennifer, you're a leader among the girls in here. I'm Hispanic girls. I'm going to ask you to help me. So that leader could have turned into a troublemaker, right? They're the ones who kind of are the queen. He's got that person ensnared in her little web of learning. And man, that's a great thing. I love it. He did so many cool things in that room. He did so many cool things. And you would be, it was so funny. You'd be sitting over here, and you would hear, over here, you know, blah, 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 and everybody's over here talking to each other. But then when we got to the point where she was ready for demonstrations, and kids would come up to her smart board, she taught them how to use the smart board. Not to come up and go, let's move this over here. They actually develop content that they showed on the smart board to demonstrate their understandings. Hello? In a room that's 45% Spanish speakers? Could Lindsay speak Spanish? Enough. You know, enough. But because she was asking them to think, which I like, I did love it. You know, that old principal finally got up the mess. Was his uh, Malone still there at the library? Little blonde? No. Yeah, I think she got put out by that first principal. What's that library? Where are you? We're all at Fonda. <laughs> Where are you? Where? Oh, yeah. Okay, that's another one. Is he still down there? The principal is. Uh, Where's the conference? This is that room down there that are pretty good for students. Yeah. Where are 
Did you see the iPads fucked around the building? They weren't the first places that did iPads. Kind of shit. Uh, Atkinson is, is that classic boat on the roof. It gets everything thrown out. Like that's going to fix it. It drives me nuts. You know, and then everybody goes, hey, hey, we told you. You give those kids some technology and they just don't know what to do with it. They don't. And you just want to scream. You just want to scream. Because it's like, when I go into North, which is basically the middle school of students for boys. That's what I mean. And, huh? And it's just, you just sit there and you go, what are we going to do with all these iPads? You know? Mr. Rodowski, who has a great perspective, Bob got it. He understands what his problem is. I'm not getting much support from the district. The district is kind of going, but well, they'll do people learning. And his teachers are all out there going, what the hell is that? But you got to convince people. you got to go in. you got to say, here's what it is. And the thing we don't do in education is problem we have to do. Right? This is what we want to do. Go so make people do it. But we never give her a chance to test it out, play with it, see how it's going to work. We teachers will do that, right? they got enough control of their classroom. They can basically go, okay, guys, look, this is what we're going to try out. And if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. We won't do it. Teachers who are still trying to figure it all out, that's terrible. Where are you? I was working. You okay out there? Are you in classes? Yeah. Montessori or is it great? Sneak out and go look at Monster. I think that's a that should be the future. But it just makes all the sense. It's how to be responsible for their Okay, you all understand? We get going on this like I see you okay. And we get around to the picture chart and I go, let's uh okay, so that works. You'd be logging in as me. You'd be logging in as me on a lot of this stuff. You are more than welcome to use it when you go out into school. Okay? I try to create everything so that you have the master login, but you could go in and you could make a class of the name class. And then you could put kids in so they're not logging in as me. But we'll look at the examples that already exist in the picture. You don't go in live. Um, and then when we get back together, we'll go and show you where it is in live text. By the way, live text is ready to rock and roll. Uh, Mary, your live text is not ready to rock and roll because I have to make it a separate uh, live text. There's uh, a different section. So it's ready to go. I checked it over just in the no live text, right? You're not going to freak out when you're around the online. The only thing you're going to do in here for live text is cut and paste. Copy and paste. All you're going to do. Your final will be basically you know, five prompts and then Steve will tell you right now, I don't want to see the break there. Right? You got any questions for me? Have a wonderful Monday. Off. Uh, when we get back together, we'll dive in chapter yeah, two and three, get a chance to read it, and we come back on that Monday afterwards. If you have it read it, you'll be on enough, honest enough to say to me, I did. And we'll do it. We'll read it here in class. Fair enough. Mm -hmm.
You would be real soon. I will. Okay. If I you're not, you right. yell. Okay, well, okay. I was going to tell you, I have the book. I have really so I have my paper copy, so I'll still be able to do yeah, so everything no, I There's no different objections yet. That's why you let me do all that. Gotcha. So, yeah. But seriously, you know, look at Blackboard for the rest of the week. Okay. Well, and it doesn't pop up. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Because I will. Oh, yeah. It's easy. Honey, that's the easy part of this job. A little concerned that your advisor didn't know how to do that, but, you know. Yeah, I know, hon. Listen, I know. Mary, do you have anything for me? You still there? Yeah, you're still here. Hey, Mayor. Uh, can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Um, I just, I could hear you for the most part. Right. There were a couple of sections where it was in and out, so. Right. The problem is um, I'm a walker talker, but when we get into the real stuff, like next week, or not next week, the Monday after next, you heard me talking about sitting around the virtual yes. campfire and looking at some of those videos that are in there. We will literally do that. We will pull our chairs up yes. here in the circle. We'll put the microphone to where it'll pick up all the conversations that you'll be able to hear. And what I'll do when I start doing things like the pick to chart stuff, I make sure that I'm very close by the computer. Well, of course I have to be. And that way you'll hear me very clearly when we get into that kind of stuff, okay? Okay. I'm very, very right. aware. Sounds good. I'm very, very aware, Mary, of um, the sound quality, the video quality, that I want you to have. The nice thing about Ultra is it's a very good product. It works really well. But don't worry. I, that, that again, was me walking around here tonight, and I should have stayed by this microphone. So don't worry. You'll be able to hear. Okay. Thank you. And you know you. how to get a hold of me. Yes, thanks. All right, dear. You have a wonderful All rest right, of bye the bye. week. Enjoy your Labor Day. Mm -hmm. I'm signing Thanks, off. You too.